Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be back with you and uh, trusting that God has been with us since last we met. Uh, Jill, thanks so much uh, for reading and praying and leading us off uh, as we begin to look at God's word this morning. If, keep your Bibles open, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 through to verse 6. And our theme this morning is confidence in Christ. Um, an outline here, which we'll refer to shortly um, in a bit more detail. But I have been thinking just these last uh, number of days, number of weeks really, how easy is it to lose confidence in those who lead us? Uh, you, you perhaps know where I'm going in our thoughts uh, with that at the moment. And a, a loss of confidence often coincides with seemingly bad outcomes, bad results. We're directed in a certain way, and yet as the results become apparent, because the results are a lot worse than what we're expected, we lose confidence in those who are leading us. And politically, we can see at the moment that evidence is all around us. I guess we can often see it in other areas of life. We, we see it definitely in sport. Um, it's a results-driven game. And whilst results go well for us, we have confidence in the ones who are leading the club, uh, managing the team, playing on the team. But as soon as things go wrong, we begin to lose confidence in those who lead us. And there's often cries for people to be sacked because of the results. We see it with technology that goes wrong in sport. If it's VAR, we like VAR if it's in our favour. If it works against us, it's a terrible idea. Who ever thought VAR was a good thing? And generally, our loss of confidence in these things really does depend whether we agree, whether I agree with it personally or not, with the technology or with the individual or with the person who's actually leading us. For Peter as he writes way back in the first century, he urges the believers to have complete confidence in Christ, even though things around them was not working out too well. Remember, they're strangers, they're scattered, and they're suffering for their faith. And Peter says, listen, you can have complete confidence in Christ, and the victory he has won on the cross for all who believe. That's why we spent a few weeks in and around chapter 3, verse 18. It's a key verse. And being confident in Christ and the cross, we can have confidence in his example and his pattern for living for us. And it is evident in this letter that for the believers, things were not going quite right it seems that it was really tough for them to keep going. There was opposition all around. Some of it was more direct than at other times. Some of it was physical. Some of it was verbal. Some of it was more subtle. And Peter recognized that for the believer that it's easy to lose heart. It would be easy to question faith. It would be easy when they see other believers that are being directly opposed, directly persecuted, and perhaps experience some brutal outcomes, that they're saying, is this what we signed up for? Is, is this what the good news about Jesus Christ was all about? And even as they see some believers who, who die, whether through persecution or just natural causes, but what is next? Is there really life after death? Because this didn't seem ideal here on earth. Is there something more beyond the grave for followers of Jesus? And Peter, as he writes, he urges the believers to take heart, take courage, follow the example of Christ. Listen, you can be absolutely certain, you can be absolutely confident in Him 
in his work on the cross for those who believe and his pattern of life for those who follow him. So let's just remind ourselves quickly, what is the pattern of life? What was Jesus' pattern? Well, here it was, life here on earth, which led to suffering, which ultimately led to death, which led to a resurrection life and an ascended Jesus. That's the pattern. That's Jesus' example. And that is the pattern that Peter urges the believers to follow. Listen, have confidence in Christ. He's gone before you in every aspect of living. In this world, there'll be a struggle. And our struggle is against sin. And because we're believers in Christ, we will suffer in some way. We will die. Some directly for their faith in Christ. But we will all die one day. And it is only in our death that we receive the full victory and the full assurance of everything that Christ secured for us on the cross and through his resurrection. We will rise again, says Peter, to a glorious new life beyond the grave. Be confident in Christ. Confident in his example. No matter what the circumstances are, and no matter what may seem to engulf you, engulf us. And that's so true for us today. Just as it was for those first century believers, it's no less a truth for us today. Even though the circumstances surrounding us and our walk with Christ and our struggles in the Christian faith, we can have complete confidence in all that Christ has secured for us and his example. How tough was it back in the first century? How tough is it today in the 21st century? Well, Peter describes life for those believers like this. There is a war against your soul. There are sinful desires that wage war against you. That's how dramatic it is. That's how tough it is. It is dramatic language. But Peter's not brushstroking things he's saying as it is. Listen, this is what's going on for your soul. And for those of you who belong to Christ, for those of you who already know the good news of sins forgiven through the work of Jesus on the cross, well, listen, the victory for your soul is won. Satan cannot have you. And because he cannot have you and victory is won and secured by Christ, what Satan seeks to do is he seeks to make you ineffective. There's a war going on for your soul, for your desires, the sinful desires. He longs to make you ineffective for Christ. He wants to see you compromise your faith for Christ. Why? He doesn't want your faith to be distinctive. He doesn't want your faith to stand out. Why? Because if it does, unbelievers will see your faith and trust in Christ and will turn to Christ and give praise and glory to God. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 to 11. Again, those verses. And as we begin chapter 4, it's a similar thought that Peter has as he addresses the believers again. He brings their attention to the seriousness of the battle. Here's what it says in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves. It's a war footing. There's a battle that rages within. And Peter says, arm yourselves. So for this morning, simply... We're missing chunks out that we could spend more time on. But simply this morning, just an outline here for us to take a look at. Three things to occupy our thoughts. There is opposition found in verses 3 and 4. And that opposition comes from unbelievers. There is a response that is to be made by the believers. And we see it in verse 1 and 2. 
And then there's an assurance that comes through the Scriptures, an assurance that the believers has that is found in verse 5 and verse 6. So let's just take a little bit of a look at this opposition found in verses 3 and 4. It's a, a more subtle type of opposition that Peter's perhaps describing here. But it's as equally dangerous as a full frontal attack. The challenge, says Peter, to believers is to turn from Christian behavior and turn to back to the way things used to be for you. Or, if they weren't quite like that for you, to turn and embrace the culture of the day. Now, if we look at that list, pages, uh, verses 3 and 4, paint a graphic picture of society in the first century. And to be fair, it's one that we can certainly identify with today. Even if some of those things haven't directly touched our lives, we can see them around us. And we know they exist. But we also need to understand this. When Peter speaks of idolatry, and Paul picks it up in the book of Romans um, at other times, idolatry is not just about bowing down to a false god that is, that is man-made or to a golden calf or to a, a goddess in a temple in Rome. When Paul and Peter both speak of idolatry, it also includes the exchange in the truth of God for a lie. That's what we do. If we exchange the truth of God for a lie, we begin to worship and serve things that have been made rather than serving the Creator and worshiping the Creator. And in simple terms, idolatry is this. If you or I have something else or someone else ahead of Christ in our heart, in our minds, it is misplaced worship. It's idolatrous. We, we could make a list of things. Easily make a long list of things. And the thing is here, and Peter is, is trying to get at this, it's subtle in how it attacks us. If Satan was to come to you and to me and to these first century believers and, and if, if he was able to come and physically say, deny Christ, turn from Christ, we can see it as a full frontal attack that we would withstand with God's good grace. So Satan in his dealings is much more subtle than that. He comes in the back door. And what we find ourselves on, we find ourselves on a slippery slope. And we didn't even know we were there. Until our attention was brought to how far we fell away from Christ and turned away from Christ. The pressure for believers to conform to the world's pattern was there in the first century just as it is in the 21st century. Ask yourself this question. Are the things that you accept now that 10 years ago you wouldn't have accepted in terms of behavior, in terms of culture, in terms of your standing? are the things that you watch now that you wouldn't have dared to watch 10 years ago or listen to 10 years ago. Oh, the slippery slope. We've not even realized we're on a slippery slope. We're conforming to the pattern of this world and to the culture of this world. Why? And Satan says, so you'd be less effective for Christ. In a war, 
in a in an old fashioned war, if you like, and and by that I mean even in recent years, your enemy wore a uniform that was different to your uniform, and it would make them stand out. You could see who you were fighting. You could see who the battle was against. For the believer, the enemy doesn't wear a uniform. He looks like you. You can't see the slope. It's a gentle decline. The, the, the picture, you can't see the current in the water that drifts you away until it's too late or in danger of being too late. And for the believer, there was and is alongside the direct abuse, this subtle opposition. And I guess for us, in our culture, in our day, most of our opposition is subtle opposition rather than direct abuse and physical persecution. But it is equally dangerous. And if Satan cannot get you or I to deny Christ with our lips, he subtly works away in our hearts and in our minds so we deny Christ with our living. It's a war, says Peter. There's a battle that's raging. Your soul is safe and secure, but there are sinful desires that are at war within you. So what are we to do? What is the believer's response to all this? Verse 1 and 2 help us. Turn to Christ. But chapter 3, verse 18, it's a key verse. It's key to the whole book of Peter. Let me read it again and remind you. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body and made alive in the spirit. Turn to Christ is the response of the believer. Christ suffered on the cross. The debt of sin is paid for. Sin and death defeated as Jesus has risen from the dead. And his victory, hear this, his victory is the believer's victory. His victory was for the believers in the first century and the 21st century. It was their victory. And so we can have confidence in Christ. Confidence in all his work and all that he has done. So what is it that Peter says in verse 1 of chapter 4? So arm yourselves, what with? With the same attitude of Christ. With the example of Christ. Let me read it again. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same Attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is finished with sin. Identifying with Christ. Sin is finished. He suffered on the cross and sin is done with. Identify with Christ, Peter says to the believers, as you suffer for your faith, your desire to sin is dead. That is not that we become perfect. Far from it, we all know that. But our desire ought to be that sin is dead within us that is how we ought to live like christ uh, as our example it's been a really interesting few months hasn't it unprecedented in our days in perhaps well for for, for many a century and i think there wouldn't be any of us who have not been amazed initially at how little protection our frontline workers had in the battle against COVID-19. 
just turn back the clock a few weeks, even, even today in certain places, very little protection for those who are facing frontline issues. Sent out to battle, because it is a battle, with something that they cannot see without the protection they need, they need. Without the protection that's needed and essential for them. And it's madness, isn't it? It's crazy that we've allowed that to happen in our day with all our wealth. I wonder, as a believer, as you go out into this world and live where the enemy is unseen, as we go about our daily activities, Peter says it's a war against sinful desires, raging, arm yourself, this sin wants to trip you up. This sin wants to entangle you. This sin wants to turn you away from Christ. This sin wants to make you ineffective. This sin wants to silence your lips so you won't speak of Christ. This, this sin wants to, to dull your life so you don't show Christ. I wonder as we go out into that world how we arm ourselves. Do we arm ourselves with Christ and his attitude? Well, what does that look like? It's not an apron that I can put on or, or a mask to cover my face or gloves. It, it, it's not like PPE, is it? What does it look like? Well, if we want to know what the attitude of Christ is like, we find it in God's word. Because that is where we see what Christ is like and what Christ has done for us. His attitude is found here. Arm yourselves, says the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Or put on the helmet of salvation, put on sandals, put on so many other things. But this is what we fight with. This is the Word of God. This will help us in the battle. It's our choice weapon. It's our go-to weapon, says Peter, says Paul. It reminds us of Christ and his attitude. We can see that in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. We can see that at the end of, of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians and into the first few verses of chapter 5. Follow the example of Christ. Live like Christ. Love like Christ. In every way, how can I be like Christ? Well, arm yourself with his word. That ought to be the response of the believer. How will I know I'm on a slippery slope? His word will show you. How can I get back from the slippery slope? Well, you just turn to Christ. Confident in Him. Confident in His love. Confident in His victory. How can I know that? Because the Word of God tells me so. Arm yourself with His Word so we can be reminded of Christ Himself. Of His victory of his promises, of his assurances, of his help, of his very presence with us in the fight. Well, our time is fast moving on. So I just want us to bring a few thoughts together to what comes next in verses 5 and verse 6. And Peter ends this little section by reminding the believers of the confidence and the assurance they have in Christ beyond the grave, beyond this life. Christ is not just for now. Christ is for eternity. I'm not just Christ now. I'm Christ for eternity. 
And Peter goes on to say, and he's, he's talking about those who, in some senses, have given out the verbal, are opposing the believers, are persecuting. And he says to the Christian believers, hey, listen, there's a judgment to come. There's something beyond this life and there is a judgment to come. And those people who are calling you to account for your faith will one day be called to account by God himself. And they will stand before God and have to give account to God. And they will not get away with it. And whether they be alive or whether they be dead, they will one day face God and be answerable to Him. I wonder what kind of, of hope that that brought to those first readers in the situation they find themselves in. I wonder how that helped their confidence and their encouragement to turn to Christ. But even more, says Peter, the, the cross which to the world was foolishness and the cross which to the world looked like failure, the, the cross was victory. And the cross brings hope. And for those believers who have gone before, who have suffered for their faith, they can know that in Christ the death that they have brings final victory. And they can be assured of the pattern of his life will be the pattern of theirs life. That they will be raised to life, eternal life <clears throat> with Christ. And the gospel that was preached to them, bringing salvation, guarantees their future beyond the grave. And what a great hope that would have been then. But what a great hope it is for us today too. No less a great hope. And as we look at the pattern of Jesus' life, it's so helpful for us. Suffering, death, resurrection. So too for the believer. As aliens and strangers in this world, we suffer. We suffer for our faith. In some way. Perhaps very subtle. But death brings not the end. Death brings the final victory. We can have complete confidence in Christ, says Peter. We can have complete confidence in the victory that he has won for us on the cross. We can have complete confidence in the example that he set before us as he lived, walked on this earth. Died, risen, ascended. I wonder if the challenge for you is to respond to that gospel maybe for the first time and put your trust in a Savior who died for you, who longs to forgive you your sins, who took your sins upon himself on the cross to make it possible for us to know God and to be with him. Or perhaps I wonder whether you need to remind yourself that you're in a battle and what will you arm yourself with? Or perhaps you turn around and you see how far the slope you've gone down. And how far the current has taken you away from where you ought to be. And the challenge for you is to turn to Christ. Just the same. And come back to the cross in repentance and faith. Knowing that your soul is secure and safe with Christ but desiring to wage war with the sin and the desires that are within. It's been good to be with you again this morning. And as we finish, I'm going to hand over to Lillian and ask Lillian if she'll just introduce the final song for us and then pray.
as we complete our service this morning. Amen.